What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel and welcome back to another video. We are continuing on with the KOH build video series. Even though it's already done, there's still a lot to catch you guys up to speed on, on stuff I never got around to editing the last 30 something days of the build. So in this video, we are all over the place with a ton of projects. Hydraulic bump stops, getting the axle brackets welded in, working on our rear firewall with my daughter Ellie. Really all kinds of projects are packed into this video. And just like the last video, I am including race footage in the bottom corner. Now I know some people aren't a fan of that. It is a little bit distracting, but it gives something you know, a little bit extra for those of you who don't want to necessarily see all these, you know, random projects we're knocking out. Gives you something to watch in the meantime and you kind of go back and forth between the two. Don't worry, we are still doing a full race recap video coming up soon. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, sit back, enjoy the video, and I'll see you guys at the end. So here is our finalized battery tray mount. So mostly the weight of this tray is going to sit on the tubing these mounts are just going to hold this battery tray down to the tubing. So we have two over there and one back there, and they all line up nice and perfect, stepped up to a 5 16 by 24, which is a fine thread bolt. Had to order those on Amazon because they do have that concave recessed face to them so our battery tray can sit flush. So those are coming in the mail. We are gonna put some red Loctite on that so it doesn't go anywhere. And for a race scenario, we can go one step further once those are in. We could just put a little tack weld here on the corners just so it's not going anywhere. And if we need to remove it, that's just easy to grab an angle grinder and buzz those off. So we're gonna throw the batteries in later, but our next round of upgrades just came in from Amazon. We got a big old box of stuff, so we're good to move on to our projects. So the other day I was mo mocking up this fuel fill without this bend in it, and the hose was just a little too kinked for my liking. So I ordered up a two and a half inch, 45 degree stainless two and a half inch pipe. That way we can angle it down and then put our hose here and it'll be a nice straight shot. So what I did is went ahead and cut our fuel fill back about an inch chopped up a 45 and we're probably only going to use about this much but i'm going to go ahead and tig weld this we're going to cut this and then run a bead all the way around to act as like a raised lip to help our uh that tubing stay in place and not move around like each one of these little projects it takes a lot of time and a lot of planning things out to get them all to work. And typically like Jeep projects like this, I would give myself like three or four days just to really do a project, not too, don't have to work on it too fast. But when you're building a race car and you only have 38 days left for your projected goal, stuff like this has to be done. Bing, bang, boom. And you gotta make sure you're doing it right. This actually fits really nice. And by the time we put a bead on there and some hose clamps, it ain't going anywhere. So we might not even have to cut that but you see how much, yeah, we'll cut it back. See how much better of an angle that is? Naturally falls to that position without kinking the hose whatsoever. So let's bring out the TIG welder, get this together, keep on moving on. It's not beautiful. Probably take me another 20 minutes to take this up, so. See you when it's done. So I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. Everything is looking nice and smooth, nothing's in a bind. So we have that TIG welded there and we have our little uh, little bump right there TIG welded. So all we gotta do is throw some clamps on and now it is time to move on to our next project which is hydraulic bump stops. So in the last video with the suspension, I was talking about, you know, we set limit straps, the last thing to do is set our hydraulic bump stops which is also gonna save the shock. So at the end of the stroke on a bypass shock, there's what they call a bump zone where it gets really, really, really stiff and it's almost like an internal bump stop in your, your, uh, your bypass shock. But we still need a set of bump stops, hydraulic preferred, mostly to help our bypass live a little bit longer and help it cushion a lot more. So as you can tell, I have it mocked up in here on the inside of the frame. Traditionally, you would, it's better to mount it towards the end of the tire. The further out you can mount it, the better it's gonna work. But in our case with our shocks, dual shocks outboard, 
even with the frame sucked in, stuff gets really, really tight and we'd almost have to notch into the frame here. And I don't want to do that for strength reasons. So we're just going to bring it on the inside of the frame. By the time we have bump stops, coilovers, and a bypass shocks, that's way more than enough hydraulic dampening happening for a pretty lightweight rig. So this is kind of the rundown on how I am mounting these Fox hydraulic bump stops. So these are the 2.0s, two inches of travel, two inch diameter body. We're running pinch mounts. The whole pinch can style, there's either the threaded, which I've ran on the JK and Gladiator, or these pinch mounts, and there's really no pros and cons to each. The threaded ones, you can get a little more fine-tuned adjustability. These guys make it a little easier for mounting. We have some bump can brackets from Dave's Custom Unlimited, and all this does is kind of triangulate this bracket off the frame and make let us kind of do whatever we want. Might have to trim to fit it since our frame. It's a universal kit. This is how that back plate sits on. We're gonna weld that and the other plate in that back corner. I have everything mocked up with the lift and suspension at full bump. So what, what, what I did here was just hook up or mock up our hydraulic bump stop with some DOM tubing. I measured how much this would be compressed on the bump stop and stuck some two inch DOM tubing in there. So this is mocked up like it's at full compression. So I had some Barnes four wheel drive bump stop pads on the axle right there, just threw them under there. And we needed a little more extension on this bump stop. Otherwise, by the time we drop this down, there wouldn't be much support on the top of the frame because it would be way on the bottom side of the frame. So I evened it out as best as I could. And we'll just have to raise up this bump stop pad about one inch and get rid of that Terraflex, uh, I think it's a JK spacer. So at this point, with everything happy, our bump stop is going to compress right before our bypass does and our coilover shock back there. We want these to be the physical bump before our shocks bottom out. Bottoming these out first is going to help once we're at flex, but we'll tackle that later because Bumping at flex is never the same as like a level ground bump. And what you actually have to do is build an axle pad that is offset in the direction it moves to and bumps it at that angle opposed to flat. It's very, very kind of tricky to uh, discuss without showing you guys. And the more inboard you mount these, the worse it gets. So that is enough yapping. Let's tack these up, bring it over to the bench and weld it up and then bring it back over here and weld it to the frame. Yeehaw! Beautiful. We can try to clamp this up, keep these angles and weld it without clamping. Ooh, I just only tack that. But as you can tell, I've went ahead and welded the bracket together on our bump mount over there on the table. So what you wanna do is leave it with two inch DOM tubing. You don't wanna weld it without anything in there. Otherwise you won't be able to fit your bump stop in after welding. And you don't wanna use your bump stop because hydraulic bump stops don't like welding heat. But all we have to do now is weld this to the frame, making sure everything is nice and square. Everything has good contact, I like it. So projects are rolling, we are hopping all over the place. We have 37 days left until the gates at King of the Hammers open. We have until the 31st of January until our actual 4500 Everyman Challenge race. So we have time, but I would like to get this finished well in advance before that 37 day mark. So we have time to fire this thing up, Go through the engine, it needs to go through a heat cycle. We need to make sure everything works. We need to test it, we need to learn it a little bit and get out there with time in advance to pre-run the trail. So we are cutting it close. So at this point, we are just going to go vlog style probably and just continue moving on on projects. So 
what have we gotten done recently? So we tied in our steering box here over to the cage. It is removable so we can still pull off the steering box, but that tie in turned out really nice. It's gonna stabilize the box and just really take more load off of our frame and distribute the stress from the steering box throughout the chassis a lot better. Made some really slick headlight mounts over here and we also incorporated all three bolts on this pivot point so these aren't gonna go anywhere. You can also go ahead and see that these are the brand new, they actually debuted them at SEMA. These are the Harbor Freight Rock Sport Edge lights. Now these are the six, they have a four, and we do have those for the Jeep. I was lucky enough to get my hands on these. The guys over at Harbor Freight wanted to see them on the race Jeep, and I figured, hey, what a this is a perfect scenario to test them at. So far, they look really well built. We have nice connectors on the back. This is a very nice light, but we gotta fire it up and of course see if they work and we will test those out later. But today's project is gonna be trying to figure out how in the world we're gonna put a bump stop over on the driver. Passenger side, inside, we should have plenty of room, but we really gotta cycle the suspension to make sure that upper link mount is going to clear. It should, the weight of the track bar moves the axle. Everything should be good, but before we fully burn that in, I wanna check that. And over here, we're, there's just no room. And we're playing with the devil right here, so we could notch the frame in there to kind of flush mount our bump stop right there, but when we do that, we're, I mean, technically kind of weakening the frame at that point point. and with everything that we have going on up here i don't want to create a pivot point in the frame and create a weak spot right there so i don't think flush mounting it or recessing it into the frame is a good idea and with our bypass shock right there by the time this side gets dropped out it gets way too close to the frame so inside the frame we go but the issue is we don't have a good spot to bump to now traditionally you could just have an axle truss that runs over and bump on that but with how much down travel we have actually with how much up travel we have our frame rail gets so close to the axle that a truss wouldn't go over there so what we're going to do is build a little pad off the upper control arm mount there box it in weld it together and then run a stringer because it's going to want to rotate run stringer like a little mini truss down to the tubes on both sides and tie it in and hopefully that'd be an acceptable spot to bump from and We'll see if it holds up. Now, I'm not 100% on that because this is a little bit iffy. We also need to start turning attention to our rear firewall mount. So according to Ultra 4 rules or you know any race car, you have to have a firewall between any liquid. So the front is gonna be our engine, any coolers up there. If you run a radiator up front, the firewall is gonna protect you from any flammable liquids or fire shooting back at the passenger and driver when you're driving. Same applies to the rear. So we moved our rear, our gas tank right here behind the seats. So we have to create a firewall behind us. We're gonna go off this B pillar and seat harness bar and hopefully run aluminum. So I gotta find a sheet of aluminum. We're gonna use trick tabs off to mount that, but we also need to protect ourselves for the radiator, but the radiator also needs airflow. So how we counteract that and kind of the rules regarding that is a perforated or expanded metal up here between the radiator and passengers and people. So it would, the main thing we're looking out for is to prevent rocks from flying up and boom, blowing up our radiator and blowing steam into us. The perforated metal, you really want some pretty fine stuff that's still going to allow airflow, but it's also going to kind of act as a steam barrier. And once that steam hits the metal, instead of keep going out and atomizing, it's actually gonna build up and drop down. So that's the theory behind it. It's probably not that effective because if it was that effective, we could run that perforated sheet metal in other spots, but it's a mix up. We need to protect the radiator as best as we can while still allowing airflow to help this thing cool. So that is on the docket of agendas. We finally got this in, but I need to get a, uh, a countersink drill bit so I can open these up a little bit to flush mount those bolts. And we have a list of stuff. Today's list. So the rear bumps, we have to make the pad on the axle. The front bumps, we are still far out from that. We actually need to lower the seats a little bit. Uh, we need to run the steering from our quickener up through the firewall. Uh, we need to order some window nets. We need to flex test everything and get some metal ordered and then start welding these brackets in. So stuff like that, every day there is a list of projects that has to happen 
There's a lot of work that goes into building a full custom vehicle from the ground up. So, let's get to it. It's time to turn to window nets. So we have to have window nets per ultra four, oh, per ultra four rules. And the window nets need to stop our hands pretty much from flailing out and going outside of the vehicle. So there are very limited options on SFI rated window nets and we are gonna get a custom set made. PRP does offer that, but you gotta imagine almost every single Ultra 4 racer that's building something is probably reaching out to them. So they're three to four weeks back. Luckily, we have White's safety equipment about three minutes down the road. So we're gonna make a cardboard template, get White to make us a custom set of window nets. So I'm gonna put this down and get a template made. We finished up the passenger side over here. This one turned out really nice, super beefy, but this is gonna weld onto the axle tube. So we had to make four inch diameter cutouts right there to weld onto the tubing. Quarter inch plate up top, drilled two holes with the spacing at the same distance on the rear. So that way we can add on like adjustable or higher bump stop pads if we wanted to run 40s at one point. So they're spaced the same half by 20 Barnes four wheel drive weld washers or the repair weld washers. And then I threw a gusset in the middle just to really reinforce that entire bump zone in the middle there. So this is good to get welded in wherever that's gonna sit with our bump in line at full compression. And then the driver one over here, we're still working on, but this is very, very tricky. So it slides right over the bushing there. And since the bushing and a bolt through it, it's gonna wanna deflect left and right. We have to box it in and triangulate it in like four different ways onto the cast. I really don't wanna weld the cast on this and we can, how this lines up, we can, but the bolt is mostly for positioning. We are going to put the bolt through there, make a top plate and then box in the sides on the back along the diff. So there is still load, and then when this top plate is on there, it's actually even with the cast. By the time this drops into the bolt hole, this is flush, it hits the cast and here at the same time. So if you make a bump plate here, theoretically, the bolt and the rubber bushing are going to hold it in place, but with how the impact is going to transfer throughout these brackets onto the cast, theoretically, it should work and it should hold up fine as a bump stop by the time we brace it all up. So do it all. Put this little top plate, we gotta cut this down some. And it would sit like that. And as you can see, it's actually contacting our diff. So we could weld all this together a little bit as well. I'm gonna start a little work on the power steering system with the power steering pump. Now I went with a full kit, everything from Radial Dynamics, and we'll check that out here in a few minutes, but I wanna get the power steering pulley and pump installed here so we can start working on clearances because our bump stop can is gonna to have to clear the power steering pulley. So it's time to go ahead and press that on. So what we have here is the radial dynamics pump and a PSC pulley. But when we press our pulley onto our pump, we're effectively setting our belt alignment. So I reached out to radial dynamics, see if they had any idea because I'm running their pump with the goat built brackets that they recommend for the LS engines. And luckily enough, he did have a spec. So it's three, 3.09 or 3.1 inches from the face of the pump to the edge of the belt. So we're not measuring to the flange, we're actually measuring that up into that first lip where the belt would sit. So I have my calipers here, and all we're gonna do is use our little Harbor Freight installer tool slash removal tool and we're gonna press this down until 
our bump is right around there. Now, since this does set our belt alignment, I'm not gonna press it all the way down yet. We're gonna get it right around to probably three, three and a quarter, maybe a little deeper than that. Put it on the engine, and then that way whenever we have all of our accessories lined up, we can check our belt alignment and set this correctly once everything's in there, so. Gary swung by the race car store and got a uh, Dash 2090, and that is going to change our inlet that's a Dash 12. Right now our, uh, our steering quickener is in the way, so we gotta run a 90. Hopefully that's tight enough for the radius. Last night, went a little bit further and ripped the axles out of here to completely weld all of the brackets in place. So after we flex tested, everything was good, everything cleared, it was time to just weld all of these things up. Added a few gussets, really to box everything in while still keeping it lightweight. This is all done. Same with the front, welded the brackets on the frame and the axles up here in the front. So we are ready. Axles are painted. All we gotta do is slide them up under there, put our links back in place, and we are getting some new powder-coated links from Clayton Off-Road. So those are coming, and then we'll just change them out individually. We also went ahead and threw our seats in there and got them set. We actually had to set them down a little bit to give us more clearance up there. So they are sat down. We ditched our seat brackets and we just have some uh, some tabs coming off our tubes there. Went ahead and made our uh, crotch belt bracket as well. It's on that little stanchion post, but wherever this seat belt goes down through, it has a natural, wants to go straight down. So it's about right it's actually right behind this bar right here. It's right about there. So it's a perfect spot for that. Our, these are gonna tie in over here. And then our shoulder harness is going to tie in and left goes on this side, right goes on that side, and Mike's left goes on this side, his right goes on that side. So the passenger seat is a little further outboard just to open up a little more clearance in here and to align the the driver's seat in a spot where it's you, you get more visibility and it lines up the steering wheel a little bit better. We had to scoot this in, so which kind of shifted everything over. different ways to make okay, heat. So that is... Did 
Did you know? Do you know how many ways there is to make heat? So four years until I'm in fifth grade. Wow, watch out! Don't hurt yourself. So friction causes heat. Rub your hands together. See how it starts to get warm? That's called friction. Not really, it's not really it will if you do it for hard and long, fast. Does it start to get warm? A little. If you keep going, it will. That's called friction. Next is called convection. Okay, what is convection? You see that heater up there? Then there's radiation heat. Do you know what radiation is? Like the sun. You know how when you when you when when you look at the sun with your face, do you, does it feel warm? That that's because it's called it hurts your eyes. There. It's radiation. That's a type of heat. Then, like when you look at it with your eyes, it like burns your eyes in. Right. Bam! You just turn over. And then there's con conduction. We'll learn about thermodynamics later. What happened? Right? Yeah, when you're in third, you'll learn about it. It's called science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, glasses. Ready? We can still check it with this, right? All right. Let's check. So we line this edge up. Uh -oh. okay, that's, that's pretty good. Pretty good, but not that. Right. So you want to get this one? Hold that side. Oh, yeah. Wow, almost pretty perfect. Is it? Yeah, look. Okay, that's fine. Can I get a high five? I say we measured correctly and we cut correctly. I want a high five. Yeah. Yeah, we've been working like a lot. We've been, I know we've been working like more than maybe like 10 pieces. Well, definitely more. And when we built the engine, it was so long time ago, I wasn't even the same age that I am right now. I know, you're seven now. That was back when you were six when we worked on the engine. Yep. And what well, we- Well, I was we... barely, it, it, almost until we were even six and a half. Right, and what we just, we just knocked out our rear firewall section for the radiator. And what we're gonna have to do is mock this up there, wait till we get some more trick tabs in the mail. Uh, Dad, I got a question. Yeah. Uh, Today, yes. tomorrow, next day. So I'm waiting on some, I'm waiting on some things. They're called trick tabs. So it's how this, so we could put it up there, right? Yeah. But how is this gonna stay up there? With bolts. With bolts. But what do the bolts go to? So see these things on the yeah, inside here? Um, so yeah. see all these little tabs? Okay, how am I gonna put them on my car? I don't have any more of those. I gotta get more of those. Oh, at the store. So where, there's actually a few places. So the, she, uh, I should have Ellie in all the videos. She asked all the good questions. So trick tabs. There's a few different options. I actually have, I'm being picky. We have a bunch of trick tabs from Barnes Four Wheel Drive here. So this is what it goes to. So it welds onto tubing, just those little, little tabs right there. And it helps fit onto the round tubing that I don't have over here. But, as you can tell, so that's non-threaded, you would pass a nut and a bolt through, but having a fastener that you don't have to have a nut on the back side is extremely handy. So, TMR Customs has them, and I originally got some, I think these are 3 8 3 8 is a humongous bolt to hold up just a section of aluminum firewall. So what I did is went to Amazon and found quarter 20 they have nut certs in them, so that way you don't have to send it through. And I was thinking we could use the Barnes ones, put some nut certs in there. Like but these does. other ones, it's not really a nut cert. It's actually like a hydraulically pressed fitting. So Amazon had them super cheap. Doesn't it like look like a ghost? Like with its arms back in a one-eyed ghost? It does. It does look like a ghost. <laughs> so there's a handful of places to get them. I would say Barnes four-wheel drive for the most affordable ones. TMR Customs, if you're looking for a bigger pressed in like 3 8 nut cert with on the on the on the tab. And then Amazon if you're looking for quarter 20 trick tabs threaded. That was the cheapest place I found them. So but they're not gonna come in for another two days. So in the meantime, I got got stuff to do.
So as you can tell, we already have a few of the coilovers and bypasses in, and I wanna show you guys how to install coil springs onto a coilover. Now it is gonna vary depending on your brand, whether you're running Fox, Bill Steins, Kings, any of those, Icon, they're all gonna be a little bit different, but we're gonna focus on Fox because that's what we have here. So real quick, rundown on the shock. So it's a 14 inch travel, we have our threaded body, we have our preload collar up here, which is going to set the ride height. These two adjustment little uh, little collars here are for our slider, which engages the primary and secondary spring where they actually, kind of where the slider bumps at and engages the spring. We have our reservoir, and there is one thing I do want to mention. If you order your coilovers from AccuTune, you have the option to swap out this for a, uh, a swivel fitting, which is much easier when you're trying to route your hose somewhere. And I'll show you that up in the front later on. But you can upgrade that, which is something I'd highly recommend. And they go through and kind of do a pre-tuning on your shock and tune it for your setup. Now these are right out of the box, straight from Fox, not straight from Fox, ordered them uh, from Garrett down in, uh, in Texas. He hooked us up with a good deal right when we started the build. So looking back, I probably would order from AccuTune, get them pre-tuned, get the 45, get the swivel end. But what we did do is order springs from AccuTune Off-Road. So I talked to John, one of the guys there at AccuTune. We went through the setup, went through the corner weights, total weight, kind of what we were planning to do with the rig, and he used his fancy machine and came up with some spring calculations. So what we have here, this is for the front, we have a 125 pound spring over a 225. So the front springs are a little stiffer than the rear just because there's more weight in the front. But there's a lot that goes into picking spring selections, how long the spring is, and the spring rate. So for example, a 225, it's gonna take 225 pounds to compress this spring an inch. So there's a lot of calculations you can do based on ride height and all of that to pick out your springs. Now, real world scenarios never turn out the same as calculations, and these springs get expensive fast. If you need to change your spring rate or length, you'd usually have to send them in, either do a return or just buy new ones. And a lot of places don't really accept returns on springs that you've installed. Now AccuTune does, and this is what their spring swap program is about. So if you buy springs from them, as long as they're not completely trashed and still in usable condition, you ship them your springs and they'll send you the new ones back, different spring rate. And it's super helpful trying to really figure out your setup without having to buy or go to a shop that has hundreds of different springs. AccuTune handles it for you free of charge. All you gotta do is cover the ship and you can get a new spring set up for your coilover. But that is enough talking. We need to flip this slider the other way around and remove this so we can get our springs on. Now to do that, we have this little snap ring here at the end. So all we have to do is get some snap ring pliers, kind that actually have like a tab here. And we are going to pop this off. It's probably gonna be two hands, but we're gonna pop that off, take this off, take this off, and I'll show you how it's done. We're going to start with our upper spring, which is the 125. Slide that up then. We're then going to go ahead and put our slider on. Now, this would be a good time to upgrade to an AGM slider. They're going to last longer. They cut down on the coilover noise, which is a big complaint for people, but they are a little bit pricey and we're building a race Jeep, so I am out of money. Slide that on. It's always a very easy upgrade to do later. And then all we do is grab our second lower spring, slide that in. Install the bottom retainer. And pop our snap ring back on. All right, guys, like always, thanks for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. Go down to the comments below. Let me know what you wanna see in the next upcoming videos. And more importantly, once we are done with the King of the Hammers build video series and we wrap this whole KOH experience up, what are you guys interested in seeing next on the channel? Let me know down in the comments. Thanks for watching. I'll see y'all later.